Gestalt IT is proud to present the On-Premise IT Roundtable. On this episode, we're digging into big data. On the Roundtable today, we have Stephen Foskett moderating the discussion, Nigel Poulton, Karen Lopez, Stacia Varga, and Joey D'Antoni. Check out our show notes for links to all of their stuff at gestaltit.com slash podcast. Today, we are going to talk a little bit about data. Um, data analytics, big data, what is it? It's one of those funny things that, um, you know, me, as a storage guy, I would like to say, um, I know all about data, right? Because data is just storage. In fact, I uh, wrote a blog post um, just yesterday where I said the future of storage administration is to become data administrators. That's not the same thing, though. That's not the same thing that uh, some of these other folks talk about. So here with me, uh, we have some folks who were at uh, Data Field Day uh, in June last year. Um, you know, Joey and Karen. We've also got Stacia Varga, who was not there, but we would have wished that she was. But um, to kick things off, I want to actually turn to Nigel Poulton, who uh, had a question. And um, are you ready to ask your question? Always. Always. Let's go. What is your question? So... I don't know anything about data, right? I'm a for, former storage guy, um, and I don't know anything about data other than it's, like, pretty boring. No offense, Karen. <laughs> um, but I'm reading a book at the moment called The Second Machine Age, which I highly recommend. It's very interesting. talks about the exponential growth and impact of technology on society. And in the book, the guy um, made a statement that statistics and statisticians is going to be one of the sexy jobs of the future, like of the next decade. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. But they make a strong well, isn't argument. Isn't that already the sexiest job? I mean, mathematicians yeah, and statisticians? No, that's clouds and containers. Oh, okay. the sexy stuff, right? <laughs> okay. But anyway, so I kind of thought, okay, they, they were making a good argument for it. And I wonder, is statistics and statisticians and stuff like that, is that related to big data, and I'm kind of keen on the impact that this kind of stuff is going to have going forward. Karen, what do you think? You want to jump on? Well, jump I'm sort on of this? biased. <laughs> yep. uh-huh. But so technically, it's data science that's the sexiest job, right? It's already been deemed that. Which is statistics. It was, it's, which is statistics, analytics, and business all coming together, among other things. Um, I think one of the interesting things is, so you say data is boring, and like I said, I'm biased against that. So... Um, like, for me, data has always been exciting. It's been my whole career. But I think that what's really new now is now we're starting to use data in, in ways that, aren't, that isn't just transactional. We've always had reporting. We've always had pie charts. We've always had stats in, in a business. But now we're trying to leverage it to ask questions that we hadn't even thought we were capable of asking before, getting answers for. And it's because of the perfect storm of cloud scalability, of storage prices being less, of being able to scale out both compute and also having more tools and techniques to do things like predictive analytics. Gosh, how many buzzwords can I get in here? <laughs> um, machine learning. You um, left that elastic. I, yeah. well, I can you say software that. defined? Yeah. Okay, so we'll have software defined <laughs> software and software defined <laughs> data. No. Is that you know, that really is, because I did this data for many decades, and that was all good, but now all this stuff coming together. But it's not limited to big data. Right. So I think what's interesting is the tools that have traditionally, well, I should, tr- traditionally as far as big data goes, but the tools that uh, operated on big data, the statistical machine learning kinds of things, is now being brought down to normal-sized data, right? And the tools are instead of being in big companies with people locked up in rooms, is now becoming available to the average person. Now, I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. One of my customers that I've had for the longest in my consulting practice um, is a former big animal vet. So his customers are ranchers. They uh, manage cow herds, and they're using statistical data to figure out which combinations of cows and bulls produce the best calves that grow faster than others and healthier than others? What are the things that they can figure out about um, managing disease and birth rates and growth rates and all kinds of things? It's very fascinating, but he's a small business, but he's able to take advantage of these tools at a relatively low cost. And so 
So you don't have to necessarily be the statistician in order to be able to take advantage of the power that that data, the knowledge is wrapped up in that data well, that they can give you. So that's what I think is exciting. Well, to follow on what Stacia is saying, I, and, and since we're at Cloud Field Day, uh, I really feel like one of the things that the cloud does is democratizes a lot of these technologies. I mean, when I built my first Hadoop cluster in 2012 or whenever it was really painful, uh, I had to like go get hardware. And even though servers are cheap, whatever, it's still you have to have the place for that hardware, you have to build it, you have to have that technology. Now if I want a Hadoop cluster, I can build it in five minutes in the cloud. Uh, and there's a lot of that technology. Like an, another example, and it, it's not, it's more a traditional technology than a, than a current open source one, but massively parallel data warehouse processing is, is widely available in the cloud. And that used to only be available to enterprises that would spend millions of dollars on appliances. And now you can rent it for five bucks an hour. Uh, and I, I think that's a huge shift that cloud has kind of enabled. Yeah, so there's, it seems to me that there's two shifts that cloud is enabling. Number one is, by, is the as-a-service concept where you can basically just say, oh, hey, I need some infrastructure, and boom, you've got it. But then there's also the scalability of, um, of cloud compute and storage that's never been possible. Because, I mean, the whole, the whole big in big data, people have asked me, you know, when I do seminars and so on, I, that's always a question I get. Like, big data, is this just a, a buzzword? And I always have to say, no, it's not. Because, you know, what is the definition? To me, it means something you can't do with conventional hardware. Like, you just couldn't... I mean, my example is always, like, can you imagine how big your computer would need to be to do Google in a computer, in a conventional monolithic architecture? You know, and, and the answer is, well, it just wouldn't be possible, right? We just possible. couldn't do that. You couldn't afford to do it. No, you, you, like, I don't think possible. a computer could exist that could do... Well, no, you could, you could still do some compute with scale out and everything, but you would, you would have to, like, divide up your data and then reconcile. Like, it, the thing is, the cloud is the elasticity and everything in the new tools, but it really is about being able to do that at an affordable price for a limited amount of time. I think, like, it, it is. It's the business model for cloud. It's the technical model for cloud. It's the accessibility of all these technologies. So. Yeah, I mean, I have, a, I have a customer that they do, they work in the real estate data industry, and they have to run a valuation of every house in America, and they're using a, a statistical model. Uh, and what our plan for that is we built out a little bit of horizontal scale model. It runs on a relational database, but we've just partitioned the data. Uh, but they spin up three VMs for three days a month, uh, run the model. It costs them about 200 bucks to do that, and then they're, then they're done. Turn it off. And so they'll never, they'll never spend as much money as it would cost to build that infrastructure. Right. That's right. Yeah. Hey, I don't want to hijack the discussion right, but this is kind of, it's like meh. You know, it's like, okay, we, we know what clouds do, and we're, we're talking about how it's more accessible and stuff before, than it was before. What I want to know is, like, how is it going to change the world, though? Like, what cool stuff is it going to do? So to go back to the book, some of the things it was talking about was saying how important data and statisticians and things have been in autonomous cars, in things like Siri, right, to be able to recognize natural speech and just to to like freaking change the world that we live in, right? Like I'm not, like, this is a good discussion, so that, but for so me that's, that's not. That's where, like, the, that's where the statistical part comes in, because all of those things are just machine learning algorithms. Uh, Self-driving cars, Siri, uh, or Cortana, so Microsoft doesn't yell at me. Uh, all those things are machine learning algorithms behind the scenes, because or you have a model, it sucks, uh, you keep getting more data and more data behind it. You keep training that model and improving it. And that's all, that's all statistical analytic math under the hood. So is that different to big data then? Is that what you... No, that no. So, so machine learning is a component in big data. And the thing that big data enables you with machine learning is it gives you a bigger sample size so you can have a higher degree of certainty. I mean, like, think about Siri. How much, how much voice is that system processing every day? That gives them an excellent sample size uh, so they can, they can train their confidence interval quite high. Okay, so, so those are two things, Siri, autonomous cars and things. Like, am I going to be able to one day um, talk to Cortana or Siri and tell it how I feel, and is it going to diagnose my illness, and is it going to, and can I do that? Am I going to be driving in my car, and am I going to have sensors that are like, hey, you're about to have 
this happen to you? And is it going to make us be able to do space travel? I see you're about to have a heart attack. Would you yeah. like to go to the yeah. hospital? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, yeah. that's what I mean. There like, is that. Like, healthcare is also one of the, I mean, yeah. so first of all, I think a lot of us here, like, we just hate the term big data, but we're stuck with it because it's not a thing. Yeah. It's just a way of saying new stuff. But the technologies and the thoughts and the thinking and the newness of it, that's all real. It's just not a real thing. It's not one thing, and everyone has 10 different definitions of it on the same day. But things like being able to apply this to you know, things like energy pipelines to predict failure, I mean, that could might not change the world, but it might save some lives. And reliability of our infrastructure and having sensors in places so that you can choose all that, um, that's where I see it making a difference, plus also climate science. So, you know, NASA and a lot of other organizations use big data. The other thing that changed, I think, from traditional ways is now even regular enterprises are using external data a lot more because it's available and because they can, whether it's open data or data they bought. And we're now seeing more data sharing so that everyone can do their jobs either um, less expensively or more reliability or with less risk. And so that's the changes that I see. And that's where, I mean, ultimately it's math and data and the technology to let people ask all those questions. Um, But when you describe it as just data and stats, yeah, that doesn't sound that exciting to me. But it's all about the opportunities and, again, being able to ask questions that we wouldn't even have tried to ask before because it would have been too expensive or too impossible what we couldn't have enough questions? data. Um, so the ones I think about, because um, I can never think of the, the really sexy ones, but like corrosion of infrastructure. Like you have sensors. There are sensors now. They've been around forever trying to estimate corrosion of pipelines and all of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, bridges and rail. Bridges, and, pipelines. Yeah. Well, to take, it, to take it back to your job, yeah. uh, mean time to failure on hard disk in yeah, various situations. That's a big so, one. Uh, one of the things that's going on with cloud is, uh, sorry to keep taking this back to cloud, but this interesting model, and you'll appreciate it. Uh, obviously, the cloud provider wants to reduce power costs, so they only want to cool the data center as much as they absolutely need to. So since they've built in redundancy into storage and they can deal with failure, they, they run the data centers relatively hot in these tests. And I, I know Microsoft's published some papers on it, and some other folks have. Uh, to see the the impact of climactic change, climactic condition change, on the uh, on the mean time to failure of hard drives. Which, hey, that's pretty cool. If you can run your run your data center a couple of degrees warmer, you can save a lot of money. And if your failure rate doesn't increase that much, mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's true. And then you can build systems that can adapt and and deal with failure. Right. Um, Instead of putting in an ad here for subscription socks, website hosting, or pretentious food delivery. I'm just jumping in quick to remind you that if you're enjoying the on-premise IT roundtable, to head on over to gestaltit.com. We've got coverage from across the enterprise, from virtualization and servers to networking, storage, and the cloud. While you're there, sign up for one of our newsletters, and you'll get our latest coverage right in your inbox. If you haven't already, subscribe to the on-premise IT roundtable in iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, rating and reviewing the show wouldn't hurt either. All right, let's get back to the discussion. Um, but yeah, I think that um, one of the questions that I just saw on Twitter here from Justin Warren, um, you know, the question is, you know, not everything, or the comment, not everything has to change the world. I think one of the interesting things is that a lot of this machine learning um, is going to change the world whether we want it to or not. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, like Karen was saying, like, you know, a lot of this, like self-driving cars, the Tesla way, wouldn't be possible without machine learning because that's how they do it. And now that it's possible, like so many cases, um, what's possible tends to happen. And so we're getting self-driving cars whether we want them or not, and that's going to change the world. So it's one of those things like the invention of data and analytics has created something that will change how almost everyone in the first world or in the, you know, the developed world at least lives. And that's just inevitable, well, right? A couple of things that I think of that are world changing would be healthcare, where they're able to look at specific strategies and be more proactive of taking care of people instead of waiting for people to show up at the emergency room. There are cases where um, some very forward thinking 
healthcare practitioners have said, we see a particular type of trend or we recognize a particular type of demographic that is very costly if we wait for them to come to us, but instead we can go to them and take care of certain things now before it becomes a more uh, bigger financial problem later. The other thing that I've seen is in um, agriculture where um, companies are looking at uh, hybridizations, and I'm not talking GMO here, but just simple, you know, biology of hybridization and, and being able to work through combinations of things to find what's drought resistant mm-hmm. or um, deals with some particular regions, particular issues with weather, and therefore you've, you're helping with food issues and being able to grow food where it might not have been possible before. So those are some things that I think are world-changing when you can take care of people and feed them better than before. Totally. Hey, I have a question. That, that, I appreciate those, yeah. My eyes are a bit open now. Coming to your point, Stephen, that this data stuff is going to change the world whether we want it to or not, right? So um, I've got three daughters, the eldest of which is 10, right? And I'm kind of aware that as they grow up and... Um, become adults and look to choose careers and stuff like that. Are there certain jobs and lines of career and stuff like that that, you know, artificial intelligence and, you know, be, being able to mine data and stuff like that, is it going to, like, cull a certain type of job? Because I mentioned general practitioners, doctors before, right? I mean, that's, like, a really obvious one that, you know, you can speak to a computer, you can tell her how you feel, and it would almost put that first line of medical practice out of business. I mean, it's not going to. I do appreciate that, right? But are there certain types of roles and jobs and careers and futures that uh, are going to be done away with because of what we can do with data? And, and to that point, on, on, the, medical, on the medical practice, um, you know, one of the things um, that's absolutely true is science is, is data. I mean, science is analytics, I mean, ideally. But one of the issues that I've read about is the problem that um, practitioners don't necessarily take those, uh, they, don't, they don't necessarily adopt science-based and proven facts, proven you know, procedures and so on. Um, and, and it's the same with so many things, you know, your self-driving cars, right? The big, biggest problem with self-driving cars is not the self-driving cars, it's the human-driven cars. Yeah. Right, and 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 the biggest problem with you know adopting this in farming is the farmers choosing not to adopt it because they feel that they know better, um, you know, and maybe they do. Maybe there's things that our machine learning algorithms don't know, and so you know there's a human factor as well. I mean, what do you think about about that? So I think that like all technological advances have the potential, and almost all of them have done away with certain jobs. But I like to think of it more of certain parts of jobs. So the example you use with a general practitioner is that I think that will always be needed because, or at least in definitely in my lifetime, probably a few more lifetimes. But, you know, there are some, thing, some cases where they've shown that um, vid- video or image analytics on x-rays and bone scans and everything that computer assisted on that does a better job of detecting anomalies and and are much more reliable than human ones and part of the reason for that is we have the people re- looking at specimens or reading images are expected to do it in seconds and so they don't they're not that reliable and there have been lots of cases of human read test results where all these errors are being made um, that maybe that part of the job, together with a person interpreting those things, is the types of tasks. We'll move tasks to ones that computers do well to free up humans more time to do the parts of talking to other humans. Karen, how can you, as a data person, mm-hmm. not think that like that first line of medical care, like a GP, would not be done better by a computer? Surely, with oh. tenure, I, I don't understand how you can think that. Because like, I have... When, so having just been through some medical tasks, like I have questions for the doctor. I want to be able to say, I want to be able to ask him like, well, what about this? Why aren't we doing this? Why didn't we look at that? Um, is this right, the right test? And yes, eventually, maybe that's all automated. But I think about all of our jobs, even in IT, why don't we just have computers build computers and software build software? 
um, what we've done in our own jobs is tried to engineer out the repetitive stuff that computers can do better. But that's what a GP is, right? It's just I come and I read off a list of my arm aches here when I do this, when I do that, and uh, it's happened for a month. And the Watson or whatever the GP is has access to all of our collective wisdom from forever, yeah. and it can mine it all in, like... I, but they still have to ask me, are you willing to do this? Do you want to do this? Like, it's still... There's still a care part of it. It's not just diagnosing and fixing, I think, a yeah. general medical. And that's, that's the hopeful yeah. message, I think, is that, yeah. is that it frees humans from doing the things that humans don't, do, don't like doing and also don't do well. well yeah. Humans yeah. are very bad at repetitive tasks. Mm -hmm. we, we're not good at following procedures. Well, the other thing that humans are bad at is interpreting or using information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's been numerous studies that say that the computers will make better decisions than people will. So I've always had this kind of a joke when I do my classes is that, you know, we're going to take decision making away from people and give it all to the computers. And that's when we have Skynet. Hey. <laughs> and yeah. we know how that ends. <laughs> yeah. So, so I want... I want these technologies to help people do the people parts really well and better and with less risk at a cheaper cost and while not harming people. See, I'm back to all the rules for robots. And, and we'll just do that. And we'll make mistakes and, when and we do that. Another factor, actually, that, that just came up. I love this. Thanks, Jason Nash. Um, um, humans might actually be more honest with an AI than they might yeah. be with That's a doctor, true. you know? Yes. Yeah. And I think that statistics shows that um, if people believe that they're not being monitored by a human, they are more honest with their results. I've seen that with uh, some of the election, you know, Nate Silver kind of mm -hmm. stuff, where they've showed that some of the, uh, the polls, if they think that no one's ever going to know, mm -hmm. then they're more honest about who they're going to vote for than if they think that someone's going to be judging them for making the wrong decision. Yeah. That could be big in medicine, especially, because I think that's one thing that doctors have to face a lot of, is people don't want to admit, you know, so how long have you been using crack, you know? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know who's going who's gonna to say, oh, yeah, I, you know, so. Yeah. It's because people know what's bad for them, but they do it anyway. People love doing bad stuff. Or they fib about the good things they do. I mean, yeah. all of that. Yeah, exactly. I floss twice a day. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with my... Yeah, Believe I thought, me. I thought we had data that showed flossing wasn't even effective. Yeah. yeah exactly. Well, that's actually a great example. I was the day that came out. I was literally in the dentist chair, uh -huh. and the whole office was nuts. They were all like, "Ah!" And there, the consensus was, "This is dumb. We're going to recommend it anyway mm -hmm. because we know it works." And that kind of gets back to my question about you know, you know, you have to get people to actually act on this. Good point. You know. Um, another, I saw another thing. Tesla was um, making their cars um, basically not allow you to keep saying, you know, override, override, override. Because everybody, w you know, people got used to this, you know, repetitive task of basically saying, no, 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 I want you to keep autopiloting. I want you to keep autopiloting. They're going to make it turn itself off if you say no three times, I think. Mm -hmm. So if it warns you three times. Because people just basically said, no, forget it. Forget it. I'm, I know better than you, autopilot. I really do want you to drive me off the road, you know? <laughs> That's kind of what I worry about. The On-Premise IT Roundtable is once again brought to you by Gestalt IT, home to IT coverage from across the enterprise. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at Gestalt IT and at Facebook.com slash Gestalt IT. Very original. The On-Premise IT Roundtable is produced by Rich Straffolino. That's me! Until next time, from all of us here at Gestalt IT, have a super sparkly day.